Today I'll be doing a video for the Ground Creationist Part 4. Today's special guest of honor is Westcott Downs. Now, some of you might remember Westcott Downs. He was the guy that didn't even know what DNA stood for, yet claims he had falsified the theory of evolution. Now, unlike the prior for the Ground Creationists, we have engaged with Westcott Downs, obviously, and he has been in our hangouts and live chats. But the dialogue that I had with him on one of Nephilim's Freeze videos was so bad in a, in a chat-like format that I considered him enough to be a fruit on the ground creationist and wanted to make a video about him. So besides the fact that he didn't know what DNA stood for, what qualifies him as a fruit on the ground creationist? Well, that was this gem that he sent to me. Steve McRae, limited by the gene, and this is illustrated by the fact the, that more changes lead to inbreeding and death. Science has proven this, and there is no possible way for chimps and humans to have common ancestor. Well, this was news to me. The theory of evolution had been falsified. Science had proven that chimpanzees and humans don't share a common ancestor. These phylogenetic trees were wrong, including this one that shows there should be a, a common ancestor between chimpanzees and humans about 6 million years ago, and another one between chimpanzees, bonobos, humans, gorillas, and orangutans about 12 to 16 million years ago. And this one as well showing that humans, bonobos, and chimpanzees all share a common ancestor 6 million years ago, and then with gorillas about 8 million years ago, and then with, of course, with the orangutans to 13 million years ago. But like how anybody should when they hear a claim, they should go investigate it. So I went to timetree.org and I typed in chimp for taxon A and human for taxon B to see where exactly the last common ancestor would be. Chimpanzees are also known as pantroglodytes and TrimeTree.org came up with the last common ancestor to be about 6.6 .6 million years ago. With a little further research, you'll find that the last common ancestor for chimpanzees and humans would have been called Pan Prior. However, according to Wikipedia, to date, no fossils have ever been identified as potential candidates for the CHLCA or the tax on Pan Prior, CHLCA standing for Chimp Human Last Common Ancestor. Well, could West Coast Downs be correct that the theory of evolution was falsified and that science had proven that chimps and humans don't share a common ancestry? Well, I went to timetree.org again and I typed in orangutan and taxon A and human and taxon B. And it comes up with the last common ancestor should have been about 15.8 million years ago. This common ancestor has been found. I would like you to meet Pyrolopithecus catalonicus. So after I confronted Westcott Downs with the evidence that seemed to conflict with his assertion that the theory of evolution had been falsified and that science had proven there was no common ancestry between chimps and Z's and humans, what was his follow-up question to my evidence? Well, that was this, Jim. Steve McRae, I suppose they have the gene pool of these creatures? So instead of looking at the evidence provided, he asked if we had the gene pools of the creatures that lived 12 million years ago. Now, I think he meant to say that he wanted to know if we had the genome or genetic sequence of these individual creatures, because a gene pool deals with the population, or if we have the karyotype, which is actually a chart that actually shows the chromosomes of an individual organism. But before I had a chance to inquire further to his question, he had engaged with a guy named Chris M., and he wrote to him, Right, an inbreeding has already been shown to be a border that cannot be passed. There is no lab experiment that shows anything beyond variation. He continued to message Chris M., including a quotation that I sent to him prior, where I said, He does not grasp that evolution takes place every single day in every population of species with every reproductive cycle. He tells Chris, This is called redefining the word, and continues to say, But it he wants to equate evolution with variation, then science shows it is keep within the gene pool whose boundaries are defined by inbreeding. He then continues to say, That is scientifically proven. There is a barrier between kinds, and no science has been proven to go beyond that. So here he was making another claim, that there's no scientific proof of a barrier between kinds, even though I've never seen kinds defined in any kind of taxonomic meaning. He was suggesting that speciation could not occur, 
that there was some hard line of speciation where species could not diverge into other species. So I went over to Google Scholar and I typed in a scientific proof of barrier between kinds. And these are the things I came up with. A systematic review of barriers to and facilitators of the use of evidence by policymakers. Psychopathic personality bridging, the gap between scientific evidence and public policy. Integrating R&D and marketing, a review of analysis of literature. Quantum cascade laser. So once again, I confronted Westcott Downs on this and said, I can't find anything that supports your assertion. His response to me was, obviously evolutionists aren't going to say it's straight, but ring species this, E. coli experiments show this. What? More evidence that I could be wrong? What was this link that he sent me? Well, what he sent me was Lansky's famous 20-year-long E. coli experiment, which demonstrated that mutations could cause new metabolic pathways to be introduced to an organism that allows them to metabolize a new food source based upon given conditions. I had absolutely no idea why he sent me that paper. It had nothing to do with his assertion that speciation could not exist or that there was some kind of magical hard cap of what stopped species from speciating. What he sent me was E. coli experimentation that dealt with mutations and metabolic pathways. But before I could even really get to explain to him why that paper had nothing to do with what he talked about, he had messaged Chris Tem again. And he said, then you know there are dominant and recessive genes, and the only the germline can pass things one. Inbreeding occurs when too many recessive genes are present, which puts an end to quote-unquote evolution. Dominant genes keep things as they are. There is no germline quote-unquote mutation that is positive, that isn't recessive genes. And recessive genes carry a deleterious load when there's too many. I mean, obviously this guy has gone to the true empiricism school of biology. He doesn't even know what inbreeding is. Inbreeding occurs when there's too many recessive genes? How, what does that even mean? Inbreeding is due to ancestral relationships. And as far as dominant genes, keeping things the way they are and not being carriers of disease, well, has this guy ever heard of Huntington's disease? Huntington's disease is an autosomal dominant disease, which means it's not linked to any X or Y chromosomes. And if one parent is homozygous for the dominant, meaning they have two dominant genes, the offspring has a 100% chance of acquiring the disease. And if both parents are heterozygous for the disease, the offspring only has a 75% chance of acquiring the disease. And if one parent is heterozygous for the disease, the offspring has a 50% chance of acquiring the disease. This is basic mentally and genetic. One can see this with Punnett squares. If a parent with Huntington's, which is H being the large dominant gene, and little h being the recessive gene, mates with a parent that is heterozygous recessive, both little h, then the child has a 50% chance of getting a big h, which means they'll have Huntington's. So the same thing, if a parent with Huntington's mates with another parent with Huntington's, then that child will have a 75% chance of having a large h, meaning they will have Huntington's as well. But of course, before I even have a chance to explain this to him in any great detail, he starts talking about evolution and micro and macro. So I decided to send him just a very simple explanation of the differences between microevolution and macroevolution. And I just explained to him that natural selection, adaptation, gene flow, and genetic drift going on in a single species is what we call microevolution. The processes of those genetic things be happening in multiple species is called macroevolution. So simply put, microevolution is the genetic processes that occur in a single species, and macroevolution is the genetic processes that happen in more than one species. Of course, he totally misses my point and doesn't understand my basic analogy, and what he gets out of it is this. The genetic drift that you refer to would be the AA, AA that you talked about in the inbreeding post. This is an example of how you use other words and compartmentalization to prove your theory. But the science is the same, quote-unquote, genetic drift, produces the recessive gene traits that lead to inbreeding. And you have to have AA, AA to have a change in the phenotype unless it is a blending trait such as a skin tone. What? Genetic drift is just random sampling. Genetic drift is a change of frequency of alleles from random events, not relating to natural selection. Natural selection acts upon a phenotype or phenotypical traits that go to the fitness of an organism, to its environment, and the ability of a population to adapt to selective pressures. Genetic drift doesn't even lead to adaptation. 
It's more like stuff happens. So he says that you have to have AAAA to have a change in phenotype. Well, let's look at that. Given P1 equals AA and P2 equals AA, where P is a parent, doing a Prunet square for F1, which would be the first offspring generation, we have AA times AA equals AA, 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 AA. Genotype ratio of 4 to 0. Phenotype ratio of 4 to 0. Congratulations. There's no change in phenotype. <laughs> Not even phased by the factual information that I gave him that refutes his assertions, he continues on with even more gobbledygook. He says, I know the theory, but you want B to believe a subset is variation in macro. It is the same species. How hard is it to realize that it has the same anatomy and is just recessive phenotype? And if it can mate, make toward the parents, then it is not a different species. Even if you want to call it a different species, it is at the end of, a, end of the variation matrix and will become inbred if not recombined with the parent type. You call it two species because it fits your theory, not because it is different enough to matter. That was such incoherent rambling, I don't even know where to begin. Things that contribute to speciation events are things like geographical isolation, biological reproductive isolation, sexual selection, physical or mechanical isolation, or post-zygotic isolation, where two species can interbreed sometimes, but usually does not come to term. But he does actually get something right. He says anneles are gene variations. Anneles are gene variations. But then he screws it all up by talking more babble. He says, so you are talking in circles. The same genes that cause variation supposedly cause evolution. Allele changes are recessive genes, and the expression of recessive genes is called mutations. And too many recessive genes lead to inbreeding. Your definitions are the same thing with different words. What? Recessive genes are called mutations? I mean, there are mutations that are called recessive mutations. These are mutations that are homozygous, meaning that you have to have both of the recessive genes for it to be manifest, for it to be expressed. That's why they're called recessive mutations. But you need to have homozygosity of both recessive genes. But not all recessive genes are mutations. Mutations have to do with the nucleotide sequencing, not whether the gene is expressed or not. Yeah, I can't take any more. Obviously, West Coast Down has absolutely no clue what he's even talking about or even how to even carry on a conversation in regards to this topic. He is so deluded to think that he has falsified the theory of evolution when he didn't even know what DNA stood for. So, anyways, thank you for watching this. Look forward to my next one. I've already got people in mind, and thank you for watching. Don't forget, click if you like, and subscribe. Thanks. There's a port on a western bay, and it serves